Welcome back to another video from Lizard Landscapes. We've got a floating waterfall and floating lake. So really different project for me. Presented uh, quite a few challenges along the way in trying to uh, create both that levitating waterfall and lake section. So let's go ahead and get started in creating this floating waterfall. Alright, you want to make sure you are near an open window because we're going to be using some hot wires from the hot wire foam factory. And you want to make sure you are wearing one of these professional dust masks. So usually I start off with a sketch or a drawing. So here is that basic idea where this came from. And started off with the actual waterfalls. So I knew I had to find some really tough, strong plastic. Um, so this is a container, obviously, that used to hold flaxseed. For whatever reason, this plastic I found was uh, really strong. So point being, you might have something lying around your house or obviously in, at the grocery, you can find something whereby you can uh, use this uh, to create the actual falls. So used a couple of different layers for extra strength, but bending the top of it into this uh, shape, it'll usually hold its shape. And went ahead and applied some glue and gluing together those two pieces, holding them together with some clothespins. So using one of the hot wires to cut out some XPS foam. So tracing around that to be able to create two more pieces with the exact same measurements. So holding these together with uh, some little pins and taking the flexible hot wire and cutting through that, trying to create that slope of the uh, riverbed. And so really this would be quite difficult without the hot wire and being able to create that detail. But I've got a little drawing trying to like visualize how this is going to look. And uh, so for the landscape that uh, is above the falls. So I've got a little sketch, going to draw that out onto a thinner piece of that XPS styrofoam. So I'm going to go ahead and cut that out and realize that it needed to be thicker because I'm going to cut through that to create the riverbed. I'm going to go ahead and glue those uh, extra pieces on. So I'm going to let that sit with some pins holding it together and then using that flexible hot wire to go through and cut out a nice little indentation to suggest the riverbed. So I did forget to leave a little piece at the front to be able to hold in the resin when I finally do a resin pour. So I created that. And using some of that same really uh, strong plastic, I'm gonna create a base uh, to glue the bottom of the waterfall onto. So cut it out in sort of an organic shape so that it hopefully blends in the end with the, uh, the ripples. I'm gonna prop that up and let that sit. And so here is a new um, section or segment. Don't know if I'll have this again in another video, but I did have a comment in my last video saying 
could you do a segment where it's essentially unedited? This is close to being unedited um, of your process of creating the rocks. So I've got two different rocks, wound up having three different rocks, uh, but two at this point, one on the left and the right, uh, starting off with basic like a trapezoid type shape and showing the process uh, pretty much unedited from start to finish. So this will be a somewhat long segment. And you can, of course, just skip ahead, uh, but you can watch just the left section or just the right and then um, rewind and watch the other section you did not get to concentrate on. So really, I would say most of the, the rocks, I know that when you look at this diorama, you really get distracted by the fact that it's a floating waterfall and floating lake, and you might not have noticed the fact that there are quite a few rocks on the sides. Um, but uh, for the most part, these were all created with the same technique of uh, using like a stair step technique where you are cutting, making a horizontal cut, and then making a vertical cut, uh, taking away some of uh, that original cut that was horizontal. So I'm doing that on the right there. So you can kind of see the beginnings of what looks like stairs on the right. And so then after making those cuts, you know, using your fingernail to uh, get rid of the sharp edges to ultimately try to create a more organic looking rock. So on the left there, kind of taking my sweet time with a smaller knife and just trying to figure out what is the, the shape of this particular rock. But using your fingernail to sometimes create vertical cuts. So uh, the point being you're trying to suggest cracks in the rock or layers in the rock. So again, using that stair step technique on the right, putting in a horizontal cut with the razor blade, and then going vertical, cutting down, sort of uh, revealing this layer in the rock. It at first looks like a rough set of stairs, but then taking your fingernail, or later I will show uh, using a wire brush. That will help in uh, this process of making it look more organic and uh, getting rid of those sharp edges. In a sense, it is damaging uh, the foam using that wire brush, but takes away from it looking as if you have uh, carved it out with a, a knife or razor blade. So sometimes just picking at it and gouging out some little areas to uh, essentially suggest the, the look of that wear and tear that you see when you look at a rock or boulder. So usually I am showing this in a really sped up or choppy way where I'm taking out a good 95% of what I actually ended up doing. So all of these little stages, sometimes it takes a while uh, for me to do this. So starting to use the wire brush on the right there. And still just using that knife on the left.
So one on the right progressing a lot faster than the rock on the left there. But you could just do this entire thing uh, in relation to the rocks with using that stair step technique. So using it on the right there with like a vertical uh, variation, creating those uh, little layers vertically and uh, then taking the wire brush to it to sort of uh, apply that damage and help it to look more like a natural rock. So starting to use the uh, stair step technique on the left. So getting a nice uh, horizontal cut on the left there. About a quarter or a half of the piece. And then applying a vertical cut to kind of uh, reveal that layer of the rock. So maybe you apply other techniques of applying texture and you really only do that once or twice with a particular piece. Whereas the one on the right and then the rock coming up that will be featured on the right is like nothing but the stair step technique. So starting to use the uh, wire brush on the left there. And still using the fingernail. Grew out that fingernail to uh, also be able to play guitar with it. You can use that uh, in lieu of a guitar pick. So grow your fingernails out, people, because you can use them to apply texture. In this case, to, to rocks, you can also play guitar with them many many uses to growing out your fingernail so using or working on a new rock on the right there so this one really showing the fact that you could do an entire rock with just that technique of the stair step cutting horizontally and then cutting down into it vertically and then later using the wire brush and your fingernail or like a dull butter knife to create that uh, texture and, and help it to look not so much like a pattern. Because when using that stair step technique on the right, it does it, at some point start to look like a little bit of a pattern and subsequently starts to look unnatural. So using the razor blade on the left there to just uh, apply random texture, you just have to let the rock kind of come out of that piece. Using the fingernail on the left there to kind of create a vertical crack in the rock. But the one on the right starting to look a little bit like a poorly designed pyramid. But just doing, like I say, nothing but the stair step technique on the right and then later applying vertical uh, cuts into it with my fingernail to uh, help it just look more complex. Sometimes instead of like a directly vertical cut, cutting into it like with a 45 degree angle, or maybe the cuts, like I'm doing on the right, uh, you skip more space or don't skip much space at all between the next horizontal cut, just to vary it. And then uh, having one of those cuts be slightly angled as far as the horizontal cuts. That'll help make it look, I guess, less like a pattern.
So starting to get to the finishing stages with the one on the left, starting to look more and more like an actual rock. And then starting to try and ruin all of those sharp edges on the right there with that stair step technique. So using my fingernail at first and then eventually uh, utilizing the uh, wire brush. So I would say this is a rather soft wire brush uh, they come in different uh, grades, I guess. Um, but using a soft one will help you uh, uh, really manage that damage that you're going to end up applying to the styrofoam. So using a vertical cut with my fingernail on the right so that it uh, kind of breaks up, again, that pattern of the stair step, making it look uh, a lot more complex. So I would say the one on the left is pretty much finished. And there you go. So hopefully that wasn't too long and drawn out. But creating even more rocks now uh, for the riverbed, ones that are uh, kind of elongated vertically so that they will, those are the rocks that are sticking out of the water. And realized I needed to create a back to this. So I've got three pieces again. I'm going to hold those together with pins and then using the flexible hot wire, going to carve that out, trying to achieve that uh, sloping uh, back to the piece. So I'm going to go ahead and glue this. So I'm gluing all of the layers together. So this is after I've taken the pins out. Finally, gluing these together, gluing on some of those rocks that'll be in the riverbed. This one turned out, this rock turned out especially uh, interesting. And I'm going to go ahead and glue these two pieces together, the front and back. And going to try to uh, cover up or fill in that gap. So using some glue, all of these materials will be in the uh, description as far as the materials list. So that rock is one of those rocks I was creating uh, in that rock segment. I'm gonna cut that in half. So one of those sections will be immersed in the resin and the other one will be glued on later after the resin has cured. I go ahead and glue the side rocks onto, uh, actually I'm not gonna glue these on, I'm just figuring out how they are going to set and how I will eventually glue these on. So even created rocks for that uh, top section with a technique of just creating vertical cuts. I didn't really take much out of these smaller pieces and then creating uh, horizontal cuts as well. So gluing those in to that top section area. So here is uh, how I figured out I needed to cut the entire main piece in half to create the floating lake. So I've got a uh, holder that holds papers like you would find in an office and got two weights holding the actual piece in place. And I'm going to use this as sort of a poor man's uh, cutting guide. So I'm going to use the hot wire to try to cut this in half as precisely as possible. So cutting into that now gonna turn this over because my hot wire I was using was not very lengthy 
So I went ahead and cut that in half. It didn't turn out perfectly, but once I glue this down, you would never know. But the idea being the top portion is covered in resin and the bottom portion is not giving that illusion of the floating lake. So I put on two more tough pieces of plastic to provide stability to the waterfall. So please listen to this intermission. All right, time for another intermission. This is where I go completely off topic and try to motivate those who haven't found God yet to start searching. When I think about who these messages are for, obviously non-believers come to mind. But there, of course, could be believers in Christ listening. Maybe all of these messages are for, in part, Christians to hear and get motivated to use your talents. Maybe someone listening will get inspired and come up with an idea, and that idea will be what helps a great number of people to come to know Jesus. So if you are a Christian, how are you using what God has given you to help others, and specifically to help others come to know Jesus? Maybe creating videos. Well, you say, what if I create a video and it only gets like 35 views? I would say, what if one of those views happens to be someone who takes what you say seriously and they wind up accepting Christ someday, in part, because of that video you created? If one person gets saved from an eternity in hell, it will be worth it. God just calls you to use your talents. He's the one that takes care of the results. So if you just get one view, maybe that's the view you were supposed to get. Remember, God's ways are not our ways. His numbers are not our numbers. He just calls us to be obedient. He can use a ministry no matter how small or insignificant you might think it is. Maybe it's something outside of creating videos, something a little more in your wheelhouse. The point is, get busy about God's business and use what he's given you, even if you only wind up helping one person. Speaking of that, it leads me to share the gospel, which literally means good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ took our place for all of our wrongdoings or sins and received the punishment that we should have received when he died on the cross. Jesus is God in human form. That's why he's the ultimate sacrifice. He is the only way to get into heaven, but another way of looking at it is he is the only way of avoiding an eternity in hell, which is basically a separation from God and all things that are good. He wants you to believe in who he is and what he has done for you. When you truly believe and grasp this, you can't help but be changed and want to live a life pleasing to God. He does expect you to abandon willful sin and allow him, as in give him permission, to change you. Part of the gospel is that Jesus rose from the dead three days after he had died and promises us, those who truly believe, that he will raise us up as well to spend eternity with him. The point of these intermissions is really to motivate you to do your own research and realize that this topic is worthy of your time. Check out all of the amazing testimonies online of people who have been to heaven and hell and whose lives have been transformed from following Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening. All right, so time to paint. I've got to cover everything in black. I've just got black acrylic paint mixed with quite a bit of water. And gonna go ahead and cover every last piece in black as sort of this base coat before I apply all of the other layers on top. So using a little bit of brown, gray, white, and black, but mostly that light brown to start uh, painting the rocks got this sort of base color going to use the dry brush technique of removing most of the paint on a paper towel and uh, letting the texture of the uh, surface of each area pull off the paint that it wants and I'm gonna start layering this with different colors different values and shades 
So using a lot of uh, light browns and uh, lighter colors, providing uh, highlights. And uh, sometimes you want to like get into those cracks to try to eliminate like 80 to 90% of that black that was applied first. It's too much of a prominent, I guess, black crack. It just doesn't look natural. So even applying like a little bit of a natural uh, red clay color, so like a burnt orange, but using that uh, very sparingly. and then applying some really light highlights. So all of those different layers uh, adding to the, com the complex look of the rock. So painting the uh, riverbed, gonna start with a dark uh, aqua. And then moving towards a more genuine aqua. And of course, not forgetting to paint the back of the project using a uh, brighter aqua, so it would be darker as you get deeper into the water. And then mixing together some uh, aqua and basically a sandstone color. So this will be painted on the tops. So it's, you're really just dealing with three colors that are blending into each other that's really a sandstone blending into a genuine aqua color and then blending into a darker aqua. And uh, using the dry brush technique to um, blend in between those colors and values. So gluing on some rocks in that uh, upper portion, painting in the exact same color scheme of the aqua and then darker aqua in the center to suggest depth. And then finally, sort of a blend of aqua and sandstone uh, as it approaches where the land is. And then using a clean wet brush going to try to, before these layers dry, uh, blend them all together. So you really have to go back and clean off that brush in the water because uh, it starts picking up the other colors. So with the use of a uh, cup, trying to visualize how this is looking or how it's going to look. And so using a piece of cardboard, I will cover this piece with packing tape. You just want the resin curing up against something smooth as far as the surface. I'm going to do the same thing with the barriers. Everything that the resin is touching will have this smooth surface of that packing tape on it. And I'm going to go ahead and glue these barriers together, sort of holding it all together with those little paint tubes on the side. So that is all glued down and I'm going to do a water test. So pouring in just a little bit of water at first to see if there are any leaks in that more shallow section. And then moving on to pouring in uh, what ended up being about 22 ounces uh, ended up using 22 ounces of resin. So there were no leaks, so I'm going to go ahead and put this top portion of the landscape, the riverbed, into that little reservoir. And I'm going to go ahead and glue this down and seal up all of the edges and corners again. I'm going to go ahead and seal that top portion because it will also have resin poured into it. I'm going to dam up the uh, back of it and uh, apply a little bit of glue to that to make sure there are no leaks. And I'm going to go ahead and do another water test just to make sure. 
So I've got the landscape in there. I go ahead and pour in all 22 ounces. And there were no leaks, so I'm gonna go ahead and pour all of this water into a wide mouth container to be able to catch it all. And this is just a really good way of measuring out how much resin you're going to need to mix. So pouring all of that back into a measuring container and just lets you know how much resin, because you don't want to waste resin. It's rather expensive. So pouring in two parts, one bottle, one part, another bottle, just follow the directions on the resin that you end up choosing. And I'm gonna go ahead and mix these together for about 15 minutes. And so doing the first pour, so I divided these up into two pours. So it was probably a little too deep. So half of that 22 ounces getting poured into there, left a little bit over to uh, pour the resin into that top section. That was a very small amount. And so waited 24 hours to do the second pour. I've waited in the past as little as 20 hours but waited 24 hours uh, for this one. And notice there is no color to the uh, resin. So the color you end up seeing, uh, what you saw in the beginning, is really just picking up the color from the, the riverbed underneath. So I waited about a week before removing these barriers. And uh, sometimes they can be really difficult to remove. sometimes uh, having to use like a pair of pliers to remove them, but remove the bottom as well. And that's how it is looking at this point. So that of course will go on to the uh, base section in effect, creating that floating lake. So a lot of the times I would say every time I do a pour of resin, there are these little things you need to remove. Sometimes putting something hard like a ruler underneath them can help you uh, cut through that stuff. Removing the barrier from the top portion. And going ahead and putting in some high gloss glue and uh, realized I put in too much in that top section, so sopping up a little bit of the excess with a paper towel. And so this is how I'm creating those ripples. So the, the look of moving water because all of this glue will dry clear, but those ripples will create a texture. Trying to figure out where to, uh, where exactly to glue down that uh, waterfall piece. So realizing where it should go and uh, adding quite a bit of glue. Feels like you're ruining the project. You're like, what if I'm wrong here? Um, using that, some of that same glue to create the ripples up top, doing the exact same thing on the lake portion. Just using a small brush to create those ripples and not forgetting to create the ripples in the back section. Time to glue the two pieces uh, together. You want to let that sit for a while and uh, ended up uh, applying two layers of the glue of this uh, high gloss glue to create those ripples. Found that two layers is really better to create that, comp that complex look of the ripples. And starting to paint the top portion of those rocks, so all of the sections of the rocks that are sticking out of the water. So using the same color scheme, same uh, dry brush technique of adding layers, exact same type of colors I used for the rocks that'll be on the sides. And then using a uh, pin with a little bit of acrylic paint, I'm going to uh, create the uh, suggestion of a water line. 
putting that in and then removing quite a bit of it with a pin because you really just need a little bit to suggest that water lapping up against the rocks, you know, creating that white foam. And even though those two pieces are glued together, I'm going to use some more glue to uh, kind of even out that plane to really make it look as if it's one piece. And starting to put the texture, applying the texture uh, of the waterfall. So all, again, all of these products uh, will be listed in a materials list in the description below. And then dry brushing onto those uh, sides. Again, that same uh, colors, those same colors I used to create the rocks. So I've got a certain amount of foam that will act as a way of uh, providing stability for when I glue this top portion onto the actual falls. So that will, doing nothing other than keeping it in place as I apply glue to that top area. Trying to have the glue, move the glue back into it as much as possible to help blend those two pieces together. So here's an idea that didn't really work, but I'll show you anyway. I've got some of that same tough plastic and it's the exact width of the waterfall. The idea being to create this wedge, uh, it looks like a little triangle, um, to create um, some stability for the waterfall with the piece that goes back that upper piece. Something that worked and yet I could tell it was gonna become a problem in weeks or months. I'll show you later what I ended up doing to create um, more stability for that. So installing some trees, I think there were three or four trees, so gouging out a little hole and then this is just sea foam breaking off a little tiny piece um, of sea foam, depending on the scale you're using and adding some glue to that base. Painting the actual falls, uh, just white paint. So not really a dry brush technique here. Just painting on a fully loaded brush. So painting, on, painting that, uh, top portion where that the water breaks into that white foam always seems to look like a little bit of a sawtooth design. And using a really dry brush with white paint in uh, creating those ripples, trying to dry brush that to bring out the texture of those ripples. So applying a little bit of a glue and a little bit of model railroad uh, foliage just to bring some color and then painting in some shadows to the waterfall. I've found that if I don't do this, it just doesn't look right. You've got to have a little bit of that dark to uh, emphasize or have the light show up. And then dry brushing the uh, texture of the ripples down in the lake section. So all of that white foam that would uh, be produced. And then taking a really small brush, painting in some uh, very small detail of uh, more prominent uh, white ripples in the lake. And then using a pin to uh, create some dots to, especially in those shadow areas of the waterfall to help make it look like uh, moving water. And applying a thin layer of uh, that same glue it took to create the ripples, but this time applying a really thin layer, and this is really just to cover up the white paint, because the white paint will leave behind a really dull look. Trying to, on the falls themselves, regain that wet look. So also doing this to that top portion. 
And then using, this was actually plastic to uh, create more stability for the falls. This is plastic uh, taken from one of those mini DV cassettes. And it's just really tough plastic. And I thought, let's apply a little bit more strength to the waterfall. So here is that triangle, that wedge piece. The idea being that it's going to stop that back land section from drooping down as much. Get it down into that or up into that little section whereby it kind of stops that back portion from drooping down. Didn't really work though. Gluing on those uh, side rocks. So trying to be a little bit abstract with how these rocks uh, would jut out from that landscape doesn't really make much sense, but the rest of it doesn't make much sense either. So, and doing the same thing to uh, the other side, but gluing on that, one of those rocks featured in that, uh, that rock cutting or sculpting segment, applying some glue to the uh, base of the waterfall and using cotton as I usually do to uh, suggest uh, water splashing up and of course mist. And applying glue to that piece of plastic, adding support in the back, and then trying to camouflage it with a little bit of cotton. Applying a little bit more glue to that uh, base, applying another layer of cotton, waiting for that to dry, and then pulling up on it with some needle nose pliers or needle nose tweezers. So this is how I really ended up getting that uh, back portion to not droop down, as you can kind of see it doing. So this is plastic cut out from an old CD case. It was actually a DVD-R case, but it's really the exact same thing. Found that it was plastic strong enough and yet thin enough that I could cut with just a pair of scissors. So gluing two of those pieces together so it's even more strong. And the way in which I covered up the, or camouflaged the edges, which those edges really stood out, is to apply some model railroad uh, foliage. So I kind of pulled that out to uh, elongate it and uh, glued that onto uh, the side. And I think it does a fairly good job in camouflaging those edges. Also, um, applying some vines to uh, the rest of the, the upper section, and this will help kind of blend in or help camouflage that. You can kind of see it there, the support system with the vines. All those other vines helping to, uh, I guess, distract the eye from the fact that there is this support system that is clear, but the edges needed those vines to help uh, camouflage it. Going ahead and gluing in that final piece of uh, stability for that back section. Gluing in the uh, bottom area and then of course uh, up at the top. So leave me a comment. Did you notice in the beginning of the video that support system? I'm curious. And there you have it, finished. Floating waterfall and floating lake for all of your floating waterfall needs. So be sure and check out the rest of the channels, many videos. Uh, be sure and subscribe, comment, and like uh, this video. It helps out the channel a lot. And as always, thanks for watching.